Good evening, sir. How may I help you? Yeah, uh, listen, I just got into town. I am starved, and I've got a hankering for an amazing burger. Oh, well, you're in luck. Right across the street is one of the best burgers I've ever had. Ooh, really? Yeah, it's amazing. It's in a place, really high, upscale place. Um, I believe it's pronounced McDonald's. Uh, what now? McDonald's, man. Oh, yeah, sounds, uh... Delicious. Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast with me, your host, Glenn Hausman. I am always excited to be here with each and every one of you. I'm coming at you from a hotel somewhere in Virginia this week, and I got to tell you, I'm a little sorry it took me a little longer to get this show up than normal, but uh, I was at the Hunter Investment Conference last week, a lot of stuff going on, and quite frankly, the people I was supposed to speak to in the first half of this show... It snowed. They couldn't get there. The show didn't happen. So what are you going to do about that? Meanwhile, if you haven't subscribed to our weekly newsletter, be sure to text the word HOTEL to 66866 to subscribe. That's all you have to do to make it happen. And check out the all-new No Vacancy News. Let me know what you think on the site. we got great videos on there. We to put all the uh, industry headlines up there. And then, of course, it is your home for each and every one of these podcasts, which, incidentally, is brought to you in part by Duetto, the revenue strategy technology platform that thousands of hotels are using to make more money. I'm here with my uh, my guest uh, of the week, Mr. Uh, Jeff Polly, producer. How are you? Wait, we're uh, we're in Virginia, not Maryland. We are in Virginia. I thought didn't we go through Delaware as we, well? We did. We were and in. We started Pennsylvania. In, we started. I started today in Staten Island. Picked you up in Philly. Drove through Delaware. Drove through Maryland. We waved at the University of Maryland where I went to school, and then we ended up here in Virginia. Yeah, I like the little tour, by the way, on the yeah. 95. It, I'm just so weirded out by that because normally the states that I live in are, yeah. take hours and hours and hours to get through. That's true. We have a lot of tiny states here yeah. in, the, in, yeah. in the Northeast. But it makes you feel when you're driving that you're making progress, so I, it's good. I, I feel like I'm well-traveled. <laughs> you are. But, you know, the, Jeff, I got a question for you. You think hoteliers like to make more money? I, I I would assume so. I, I think they're probably listening to this uh, podcast so they can possibly get some tips on making some more money. Well, I got one tip. Be sure to check out Duetto. And if you want to learn about all about revenue strategy, check out an interview I did with their CEO of Duetto, Patrick Bosworth. And you're going to learn everything that you need to know, Jeff, all about it. All you have to do is check GetRevenueResults.com. That's GetRevenueResults.com. I'm typing that in uh, right now. Here. Good. You better. Yeah. You better be doing that. Here. And hey, and while you guys are doing stuff and typing in uh, Duetto and GetRevenueResults.com, also check out Patreon.com slash no vacancy throw us a couple of bucks over here every single month so we can continue to bring great shows to you at absolutely no cost to you now i'm going to talk about the hunter conference but this week um all this week i'm excited because we are going to be at a hoa con uh, where we are the official podcast of a hoa con 2018 taking place march 27th through 30th at the Gay Lord National Hotel. And if any of you guys are going to be there and you would like to be on the podcast, we have an open opportunity on Wednesday and Thursday of this week at between 1 and 3 o'clock. Come on by. Share your stories. Um, and it's going to be really terrific to hear all about what your journey has been like and how you're living the American dream every single day. And we already know it's the largest hospitality convention and trade show, so a lot of you folks are going to be there. Come by and check it out. We'll be in the podcast booth under the big red roof. Thanks, Red Roof, for sponsoring that. Okay, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Let's get this show on the road. I am excited to be here with you, Jeff. Yeah, you've been... Uh all over the place lately. I, I, I can't even get like stuff from you on the internet because I don't know if you're traveling to Europe or going to Atlanta or whatever. So Yeah, I don't know, man. I've been like all I've been like all over the place. It's been like uh Go on a trip to the West Coast, get home for 24 hours, go to Europe, come home for 24 hours, go down to uh, another city, come home for 24 hours, and then keep moving. I feel like there's something on the internet that you could possibly update me on your travel calendar. Maybe, um, I don't know, Google calendar? I'm not familiar with that term. Uh, Google? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Something like that. Yeah. All, right. All right. Well, uh, yes, I have been uh, traveling. Last week, I was in Atlanta for the Hunter Hotels Investment Conference. What an event. The week before that, I was in Spain. I got to check out this great factory at uh, Porcelanosa, who's going to be bringing us an amazing design podcast series coming soon enough. I cannot wait to get that going with you. I'm down here in D.C. because I'm going to be talking to a big design bigwig tomorrow morning. I'm not allowed to share who that is just yet, but it's going to be a great interview. It'll be coming at you. And speaking of great interviews, Jeff, at Hunter last week, Man, I got some really good ones. We got the CEO of Choice Hotels, um, we're gonna, Pat Patience. He's going to be coming on the show in a couple of weeks, already recorded in the cans. The president of uh, Radisson Hotel Group, uh, Ken Green, he's uh, already been on the show. That one's in the can. We got the president and CEO of uh, Graduate Hotels. That's going to be a great interview. And we've got more. I'm recording this week with David Kong, the CEO of Best Western, the president of Red Roof, Andy Alexander, Eric Jacobs, the top franchising guys for Lex Service of Marriott. And I could go on and on on and on. The interviews are coming fast and furious and you're going to want to tune in each and every week here on the No Vacancy Podcast. Yeah, Aho uh-huh, is going to be awesome. I mean, we did it last year and it was like a great success. I thought uh, web streaming it and recording it on a video was uh, super fun and uh, I can't wait to do it again this year. Yeah, be sure to check out the No Vacancy news page uh, all week long for tips on when we're going to be going live, assuming the technology uh, works, because sometimes when you're at these big convention centers, the uh, the internet service is not so great. So we're hoping that that'll work out and we'll be able to bring you lots of live video. I'm, I'm going total nerd here and I'm yeah. crossing my f- fingers for five megs. <laughs> five megs is all I I need guys nerd <laughs> <laughs> so i gotta tell you the hunter conference was great it's um it's uh, one of my favorite events on the calendar each and every year the people there are always cool take i think the uh the best of uh, the south the southeastern united states uh hoteliers come they hang out they do lots of deals and i gotta tell you jeff everyone was coming up to me saying um they're listening to the podcast they're loving the podcast they're hearing the podcast they're working out listening to the podcast they're stuck in airports hearing the podcast and they're driving to their offices is listening to the podcast so it's great to see that as so many people are catching on to the no vacancy podcast yeah well i'm hoping that you know when i'm on the show i give uh my travel tips or lists and i'm hoping that people actually listen to them and use them because uh you know, most of them are food based and I like to eat. Oh my God. Well, speaking of Atlanta, I mean, sure, the Hunter Conference was great, but I had some really terrific chicken and waffles. And you could uh, see that video on my Facebook page. Jeff is shaking my head because. Chicken uh, and waffles. Uh, chicken and waffles. We love those chicken and waffles yeah. so much. And it, it was, that was different than the hot chicken. That was different than me going so to Gus's had, fried chicken. You had Gus's fried chicken and chicken and waffles uh, I, in I, the like, same three-day period i think the only animal protein i had while i was in atlanta was chicken of the fried nature (laughs) (laughs) and the lard that it was cooked oh my god i'm still recovering from it i uh i feel a little queasy from all of it but it was well worth it um and i had a a mega burrito last night before taking my wife to a a concert in staten island and i'm definitely have a whole lot going on between the burrito and the fried chicken and, and all of that kind of stuff but I'm still enjoying that food that I had when I was in Spain. That was uh, something else. I, I love all those tapas, man. I can only imagine. Uh, and was it, were you, I know that different parts of Spain kind of s- celebrate the dinner experience a little bit differently uh, depending on the region. Was it a 10 p.m. style dinner oh, every yeah, night? absolutely. You know, and then what lasted two, two and a half hours yeah, or correct. so till midnight, mm-hmm. 12, I was with a, a group of 17 people. I was with some like uh, social media influencers. For example, uh, Bobby Burke, who's on the new Queer Eye show. So a lot of people, a lot of socializing, a lot of bottles of wine were yeah. consumed. It, it's one of my favorite things about traveling to Spain is you go out during the day, you do your tourist stuff, then you go back to the hotel for a nice siesta for four or five hours, and then 10 o'clock, that's when you go eat. I know. I thought we ate late in New York, but... Uh Man, the Spaniards have got it on us. I remember when we went to Barcelona that time, how uh, shocked I was. That we were waiting for tables at midnight because it was so crowded. Yeah, yeah, that's how uh, Spain goes. And like I said, I, I like their style. Yeah, I like their style too. They have got it figured out. But as much great food as they have, today I want to talk about uh, the best burgers in the country because over the last few years, Jeff, you and I have both noticed how it's become like the big go-to food. I think in the, uh, the days after the Great Recession, when we went away, Away from the uh, love affair that we had with the white tablecloth restaurants, we started getting a little more casual. We started to want to hang out in a, in a, a more um, 
you know, less strict, you know, less, uh, I'm having a hard time thinking of the right words <laughs> here. It is late at night while we're recording this. After I, well, all yeah, you, you're exactly right. I yeah. think, I think every single restaurant now is trying to do their own version of a burger mm-hmm. and whether it's a five star place or, you know, in and out or something like that, everybody's got a burger, everybody you know, most customers want a burger and, uh, and we came up with, uh, you know, with our, uh, friends at Thrillist help us out here, but we've got a list of the top 10 burgers in the United States for all the you road warriors. Uh, if you're in any particular city that I'm going to list off and you want to go grab a good burger, apparently these places are the places to go. Now, the only way that I could really, um, relate to my children is through food. Right. So it's the it's the best way for me to connect with them. We're not sports family. You know, um, they're really into like um, composing music and stuff. And they keep talking to me in music theory, which I just don't understand. And I don't understand the math that they do in school. All I understand is uh, good hotels and good food. So I take them for burgers all the time. We try to discover new burger chains and new restaurants all over the place. And uh, we have a great time doing all of that. But my guess is. None of those burgers that we have in Long Island come close to the list you got for us today. So you need a Common Core math uh, lesson. Then, uh, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's going to be uncommonly difficult for them to teach me, though. I'm just glad I don't have kids, so I don't have to learn it. All right, show uh, off. You know, <laughs> calculator. That's all I need. Oh, right, here's the thing. I just admitted to my kids I have no clue what you're doing. I'm like, just talk to your mother. She's the educator in the family. I'm, I'm, I just, I'm good at complaining about stuff. That's really about all I got going for me. All right. Uh, I guess they probably, our listeners probably don't want to hear us babble anymore. They want to get on with the burgers. Well, I'm hungry right? just uh, thinking about the burgers. So yeah. Let's talk. Well, all right. So number 10 uh, is San Francisco. So anybody in uh, the Bay Area can uh, check this place out. It's apparently the garage spelled with a J at the end. Um, to give it a little bit more fanciness, I guess. I, I also, to be a little bit more distinct and pretty much to confuse your clientele. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> and uh, their drive-in cheeseburger with grilled onions is a no-frills Cali-style burger at its very best. So for under 10 bucks, which uh, in San Francisco is a pretty good meal, you're looking at the number 10 burger in the country. Wow, 10 bucks. That's about um, a half an hour of living in an apartment in San Francisco. <laughs> half hour. <Yeah. laughs> I'm trying to be generous. That's 30, probably, 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah, you're probably right about that. <laughs> I think, I think Did they, I tell you I was not good at math just yeah. seconds ago? <laughs> I, think they, I, think, I think you get charged in San Francisco to go look at the rental. Right. You know? well, I always used to joke when I lived in uh, Manhattan that we'd have to pay like a $20 wake-up tax because <laughs> you know, everything there was so expensive. All right, so fried onions. I love fried onions on a burger. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love, you know, that real caramelized, you know, onion, you know, and gives it a little bit more juice to the meat and Mm -hmm. the cheese and meltiness, goodness, and oh my God, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to finish the segment without (laughs) uh, running out to a burger joint here. I think we might have to as soon as we're done with this recording. Can we go to Delaware to do it? Uh, we just drove through Delaware. Boy, is uh, Delaware have one of the top burgers in the country? No, no, no. I just <laughs> wanted to, you know, say I drove to a different state for a Okay. Break. All right. Sounds good. Well, we could go back to Maryland. It's much closer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm confused on the geography yeah. of this uh, East Coast. So, uh, number nine, um, Royal Oak, Michigan. And that's Detroit, right? Right right outside of Detroit. Sure, I'm, I'll say. I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah. it is. Uh, I believe I've been there, actually. Uh the classic burger with sharp American cheddar at the Red Coat Tavern is your number nine burger in the country. So if you're uh, looking for a burger in Detroit, um, I'm almost positive uh, that Royal Oak is uh, mm-hmm. right down the road. Right. You can go get the number nine burger mm-hmm. in America. And it's, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to read this and talk at the same time, and I'm not doing a good job. Let's you're, doing, you're doing magical. I, I will say, while you're, uh, while you're looking, I'm going to say that I'm wondering if Corner Bistro is going to be on the list from New York City. That was one of my favorites in my uh, 20s when I lived on the Upper East Side. You could get a beer, you could get a burger. It was super cheap, super yummy. I'm going to tell you that no New York burger is in the top 10. This is are sacrilege. You, I'm, not so, I'm not thrilled with the folks at Thrillist right are, now. Really? Like, uh, <laughs> you, you honestly think that New York has the best food of all the classifications of food? Uh, dude, I'm a I cl- mean, you guys got pizza pretty hands down. And bagels and Chinese food. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. As a New Yorker, it's our responsibility to believe that we are the best. No one in the country <laughs> or world can do anything better than us and really just have an attitude about well, the whole thing. Well, even 
the last two choices and apparently the next eight are better than any place in New York. So you're going to have to live with that. All right. I'm going to see if I can. And the folks in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, if you're in the North Carolina area, you can go to Brooks Sandwich House and get uh, the number eight burger in America, which is the burger with cheese all the way. Ooh, what does yeah. all the way mean? Uh, it sounds kind of dirty doing something with a burger with cheese. Uh, all the way apparently is, uh, you know, not only that big old thick patty, but yeah. uh, you're going to get subtly smoky chili, mm-hmm. um, some diced white onions, and uh, and some really, really nice homemade uh, yellow mustard. You got to be committed to a burger to have chili on it because it's always going to get all over your hands. It's going to get all over the place. It's going to destroy the... Uh, the quality of the uh, the bun, but it's probably super crazy delicious. Yeah, I'm a big fan of a good, messy, sloppy chili burger. Are you? I'm a little uncomfortable with my relationship with messy food. Yeah. I mean, I, I embrace it on one hand, but on the other, I, I don't. I'm one of those guys that has to use like 100 napkins to get through something not dirty and disgusting. You need, you need the little wet naps. <laughs> I certainly do, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, it, it's probably one of the reasons why I never wor- ate lobster because I couldn't do the bib. <laughs> Also, I don't eat lobster anymore, at least if, unless it's taken out of the shell for me. It's just too much work. I just don't have the time. I just want to get to that lobster. I don't want to be sitting there cracking stuff, you know, sucking the stuff out of the legs. It's just too much work for me. So uh, number seven, yeah. I was really surprised that this Chicago joint mm. is on the list and not uh, the standard Chicago burger joint that everybody always talks about, the metal burger right. um, place. But uh, m- apparently Mott Street Burger... Uh, is the number seven burger uh, mm-hmm. with the Mott Burger in the entire country. <laughs> what do they got on it? Apparently, the Mott Burger is so good that it doesn't even have what's on it in the description. It literally just says, imagine biting into a burger and having all the alarms in your head go off simultaneously as you realize that not only is it the best burger in Chicago, but just might be the best burger in the country. So oh. I think next time I'm in Chicago, I might have to go to Mott Street and try a Mott Burger. Wow. I think that's a really good one. All right. So uh, what else we got on this list? Right, so I'm going to rifle through some yeah, of these. All right. Uh, so the Knife in Dallas has the number six burger. Um, and, uh, I think we all know that Dallas is, uh, especially in the last 10 years or mm-hmm. so really come up in the food world as, as a place to eat and not just, uh, you know, drive through. Right. Number five, the proper burger Duke's groceries in Washington, DC. Hey, hey the, we should go get one of those. We're here this mm, week. Yeah. Top 10 uh, burger. Yeah. Uh, number four, the tavern burger in Seattle, Washington at Loretta's Northwesterner. So, uh, you know, rainy, cold, cold Seattle day like it is typically. Right. You can warm yourself up with a burger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The number three burger. Yep. And this is, uh, this is going back to your fried onions. Oh. All right. So a cheeseburger with fried onions mm-hmm. at White Hut in West Springfield, Massachusetts. Wow. So Bruce Ford, mm-hmm. I expect to hear a full review of this burger because apparently it is the third best burger in the country. Wow. Third best burger in the country. All right. Number two. Number two, the burger at Raul's. And, Raul's? And How you know that? what? I totally lied about the New York thing. Oh, good. You, you this sick, is, sick person. I know. New York, New York. Number two. I, I didn't think that this was in the city. But uh, yeah, uh, New York's coming in at number two with the second best burger in the country. Oh, wow. So, and then the number one burger. All right. What is it? Nick's cheeseburger mm-hmm. with grilled onions. Okay, see, gotta see, have those onions, man. That's I, I think that's part of having the best burger. I, I think that uh, grilled onions are the ticket to get on this list. Right, I think so. All right, yeah. so what else? So this is uh, Stanches at in Portland, Oregon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're in Portland, uh, I'm going to read the description. All right. Uh, the sesame bun was grilled perfect, perfectly, preventing a somewhat messy burger from leaking through and getting soggy. Well, that's the whole thing. You got to get a nice crispness on that bun in order to keep the integrity of the burger together. I, I'm glad that you're agreeing with this person because you haven't before. Well, yeah, well, I told you I'm not so thrilled. Yeah, but the, gr- <laughs> the grilled onions thing. Yeah. Yes, well, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the ground chuck has mm-hmm. a good crisp edge. Mm-hmm. The grilled onions, again, we're going grilled onions, uh, which must sit marinated in something for at least 24 hours. He's uh, right. basically saying that these are amazing. And then the American cheese that's... Uh, makes the perfect dinner burger mix. So um, 
Um, when are we going to Portland? Uh, not soon enough. I haven't uh, been there in like two years. I got to go back. Yeah, I think uh, I think a trip's needed. Yeah, I think so too. All right, so I want to know what your what you think your best burger is that you've ever had in the country. Just let us know over here. Drop us a line on Twitter at Traveling Glenn or on Instagram at Traveling uh, Glenn, or just go to the No Vacancy News site and you could find a way to uh, connect with us on there. Just send me an email, Glenn at Rouse Media, and all sorts of uh, good stuff. So, um, Jeff, thank you so much for putting that list together. Thanks for having me. Oh man, I am really hungry. I want a burger, but uh, while we're going to commercial break, maybe I will go and get that burger, and when we come back we're going to have on michael tall he's the president and chief operating officer of charlestown hotels or a management company ownership group and they have had um, according to travel and leisure the number one hotel in the united states the number two hotel and the number 15 hotel over time they've got some great properties we're going to talk to them about we're going to talk to michael about lots of stuff growth of the upscale chain hotels why independent hotels are going to soft brand directions um what's happening as more brands are coming in there's even more unbranded hotels and that great trend of turning rundown motels into design oriented stylish accommodation products it's going to be pretty cool going to be sticking around check us out on the other side of this uh, commercial break and in the meantime whatever you do take care of your shoes we'll be right back have a question for your host glenn tweet him now at traveling glenn no vacancy the hospitality industry's number one podcast we'll be right back Hey, I'm Glenn Hausman, and you know me from the No Vacancy Podcast, but I have got an all-new show coming, and I'm partnering up with the number one guy in hospitality, Mr. Anthony Melchiori. Now, it's called the yin and yang of hospitality. That's right. So I need to know going forward, because I'm a control freak, am I yin or yang? I'm definitely the one that starts with Y, and you could be whichever one you want to be. I'll be the one that starts with Y. All right, so you're going to have more great banter just like this every single episode on the yin and yang of hospitality found wherever your favorite podcasts are available. Any final thoughts? Yes. I'm Yang. All right. I'm Yang. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. All right, everybody. You know, I love those trends. It's, you know, I make my money on it. I get paid to go around the country and speak on these kind of trends, but I don't make them up myself. I rely on smarter people, much smarter people than me. Well, then again, it's not that hard to find much smarter people than me to give me what the trends are. And then I quietly steal their information and pass it off on my own. Yes, that's right. Uh, my whole career is uh, about uh, plagiarizing. So I'm very proud of that. But even prouder right now to have Mr. Uh, Michael Tall, President and Chief Operating Officer of Charlestown hotels with me. Now, I've known um, Michael for a, a long time, and they've got dozens of hotels out there, and some of them, well, all of them, it seems, are really redefining hospitality and really leveraging all the trends. So no better way than to uh, to learn all about what's happening here in 2018 in the world of trends and to uh, speak with Mr. Tall himself. Michael, how are you, sir? Great, Glenn. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to have you here. I probably shouldn't have... Uh, Started off this conversation with such a confessional, though, that really my entire uh, career here is a scam. But you know, <laughs> too bad, too bad these things can't be edited, and I've just totally screwed my, uh, myself here. I won't say anything if it helps. <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate you uh, keeping that a secret. So, Charlestown Hotels. I've always been a big, uh, big fan of what you're you're doing over there. You seem to have been uh, ahead of the curve when it comes to uh, the boutique hotel uh, movement, creating lots of uh, terrific properties out there that get recognized by major magazines, being some of the best in the entire country. So, I guess the first question I have for you is. Uh, Hey, man, how do you do it? How do you um, create such hotels that really um, work well for owners, but guests absolutely love them? Uh, well, well, first of all, thanks so much for the compliments. Um, y- you know, I, I think that uh, what, what has been a part of our success was really recognize this whole movement of, uh, you know, curated locational type properties, which, as we know, is kind of, uh, if not leading, certainly one of the top three trends in our industry today, which is, um, you know, creating hotels, building hotels with a sense of place, with a curated local environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you, you obviously can't pick up a magazine or, or listen to anything online without hearing somebody talk about that lifestyle, unique hotels, et cetera, et cetera. But we were in that space very early. Um, yeah, you and, were you were like setting uh, the stage for experience like that before people even started overusing the word experience. So pretty impressive. 
Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, we, we've always had a very um, – uh, strong desire to to really be in the community to to create something that doesn't exist within a community, uh, and it could be any size any size town, right? It could, it could be a gateway city, or it could be a, a town in a tertiary in a tertiary market. So, we just feel that um, people travel, whether you're traveling for business or leisure, uh, people travel with a desire to experience where it is that they're going, and to not just do something that they could do in any other city. And so we've tried to create experiences, we've tried to create hotels, we've tried to staff our hotels with people that are very well spoken in the uh in the location that they're in and to help guide people when they come to to cool experiences. And so that's really what we build the foundation upon and the fact that you know, a large part of those are independent, while obviously the movement of soft brands is, is creating uh even more potential for a group like us uh to to get deals done. Um, you know, it's really kind of been how we've structured our corporate team to be able to work with the property to try to promote them and to create interesting things for people to do and experience. Mm, and that's the whole thing, create interesting things for people to do. So is it, you have to kind of look at it two ways, I, I guess. One, depending on the property, what do you have on site at the property to get people excited? But also, you know, how do you, you know, act as the gateway to the community of which you are in? And I, I, I suppose some places it goes one way more extremely than the other. And in some places it's kind of a, a mix. I, I, how does that work? Does it depend on um, the focus of what the property is trying to be? Yes. Uh, so short answer, yes. So, um, you know, take take a market like Atlanta, right, and compare that to, a market like um, Suwannee, Tennessee, or Bristol, Virginia, right? And so obviously completely different markets. Mm -hmm. And so we find ourselves within a market like Atlanta, let's say, or, or, or a, major, a major market, creating an experience that doesn't currently exist, right? So, so whether it is, you know, some type of F&B offering, whether it be a design of the hotel, whether it be how the neighborhood is brought into the operation of the hotel, or, or any combination of or all of those things, it's more of a, what is, what is that city missing, right, that we can create, that we can build, that, that, that would work, that people have a desire to experience that they can't experience. And then in other markets where they're, you know, smaller markets, we find ourselves actually promoting the market as much as we do promoting the hotel and trying to get people to visit there because it is uh, moving in a direction that we feel is meeting a trend, is close to a market that they've – uh, experience, but they've never been in this market. And so we find ourselves, uh, you know, working hand in hand with a TDA or a CVB, even if one even exists to create, to, to promote the market as much as we do the hotel, because we want to create demand for that market. And so it, it just, it just depends on where it is that the hotel is located and what, right. what the ownership group is trying to get out of their asset too. Yeah, totally. And, and I, I love that you take that particular approach. And this is one of the things that I try to stress to hoteliers, um, when I'm on the road, I think that uh, hoteliers have a tendency and I don't mean to draw a big conclusion. So, uh, you know, when you uh, flame me with emails to uh, Glenn at rousemedia.com, keep this in, in mind. I find a lot of hoteliers think that people want to come see their hotel. But I really believe a lot of times people, uh, the guests want to go to a market first. They have a reason to go to that market or a desire to go to that market. And then uh, most times the hotel becomes the secondary choice. So I, I think you need to promote that, um, that market in order for your hotel to find business. And I wish more hoteliers understood that particular concept. Yeah, I would I would agree with 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 that. I think that's that's a good that's a good sound uh, explanation of how how most of us travel. Yeah. honestly. Uh, yeah, and and you know, obviously, if you know, I stay at the French Quarter Inn in Charleston, South Carolina, for for example, then I may want to come back to Charleston because of that hotel. But if I haven't stayed there, I'm probably thinking about going to Charleston before originally making the commitment to stay at the French Quarter Inn, for example. So that, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, that's a. Yeah, that's a great example, right? So, so you know, Charleston as a destination has 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 uh, you know exponentially took you know t taken off in the last ten years, right? And mm -hmm. so, 
you know, we have, we have, uh, we have quite a few hotels in Charleston and they are all completely different experiences. French quarter Inn is very traditional spectator hotel is more, uh, you know, forward looking is more, you know, obviously we invoke the the twenties and the spectator shoe into, into that hotel and create a completely different environment than you would in French quarter. They sit directly next to each other on the, on the market in Charleston, Mm -hmm. but they're completely different experiences. And so people that are coming, to Charleston are choosing Charleston for a destination. And then when, when they choose the destination, then they're trying to choose the experience they're going to have in that destination. And so right. to be able to offer different types of experiences or, or what's going to essentially make, make their stay great. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm going to totally destroy everything that I just said. Then you have a brand like the Capitol Reef Resort in Torrey, Utah, um, that is so um, interesting and different than a traditional hotel experience that might actually serve as a type of property that people want to go and have a vacation type of experience because it's so uh, different and unique with the terms of having luxury cabins and Conestoga wagons and teepees and stuff that you can stay in. Agreed. Very much agreed there. Absolutely. That, 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 that's another, that's an example of, you know, trying to market an experience within a destination that somebody might not otherwise be aware of. Is that is that um, <clears throat> much more of a challenge for you, or is it kind of uh, neutral because the hotel itself has such um, unique characteristics compared to every other um, hotel experience? Yeah, it's more of the latter. I mean, obviously, in that market, if there were 10 other uh properties just mm-hmm. like that one, then it would be a completely different uh, type of approach, right? But the right. fact is that that experience only exists there pr- pretty much, and, uh, and, and the marketing of the destination on top of uh, you know, the resort there makes it a completely different approach than you would if, there were, if it was highly competitive within that same space, within that same market. Right. Yeah, that, that makes that, that makes sense to me. I I I, I love it, and I, I think now I'm definitely going to have to take my uh, my family there next summer. Not now when it's cold, no, but eventually when it, <laughs> it it warms up. All right. So so Michael, you know, you said at the beginning of our our conversation nearly uh, ten minutes ago now that you're seeing that rise of the uh, the soft brands. How do you feel that that's really helping the uh, the the quote unquote independent hotel universe take off? Yeah, so we obviously don't want to get into the conversation of defining what a boutique lifestyle, independent, uh, that kind of stuff is. I know, I know that's not the direction we want to go, but I think the uh, the introduction of the soft brands have really done more for the lending community and the developers than it has for anybody else, mm. because um, within within the independent you know lifestyle hotels. There was always a uh, there was always a gap between what a lender would be willing to do with or without a flag, um, and I think a lot of developers and those that were purchasing assets and doing adaptive reuse or, or however they were trying to position their hotels um, often heard, "Well, you got to have a flag, or you have to have some sort of a an affiliation with something that is going to secure our underwriting." Right, and so the soft brands were kind of a way that bleeded that into an opportunity to have uh, the representation of a brand behind it, loyalty programs, the pipes to push uh, distribution, et cetera, et cetera, while also keeping the character of whatever it is that uh, the developer was trying to create, right? And so the soft brands, I think, have done a great job of positioning. Now, obviously, every soft brand is different. Every requirement is different by the brand, et cetera, et cetera. So each project will have a, if it's going to be a soft brand, will have a different set of criteria for which soft brand they select. But I think it's done a, I think it's positioned itself in a great way to allow projects to happen that might otherwise not have gotten financing to be able to, 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 to get off the ground. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, wrinkle to it. I never thought of it on the uh, the financing part of it. I've always considered it more of uh, it's a best of both worlds that allows, in some cases, the owner to have his, uh, his vision brought to life without having to worry about brand standards, but also gives them the opportunity to market their hotel to a, uh, you know, 
an audience that's already pre-selected themselves that's interested in being part of a uh, of a particular brand. I think soft brands are um, an interesting and unique thing that's happened over the last ten years in our business. Um, can we? Are, do you think we're going to see a lot more of those types of brands taking off, or do you think the major hotel companies are going to be more focused on introducing their own brands that they want developers to create from? Uh, boy, I think it's a mixture of both. Yeah. I, I don't think the soft I don't think the soft branding uh, trend will will stop. I think that will continue to grow. But as we've seen, uh, you, you know, in the last two years, there's been a a lot of new brands, hard hard brands that have been created yeah. as well. And so, you know, that while we all, I guess, two or three years ago, uh, you know, kind of sat back and said, well. Certainly, there won't be more brands than there are today. It will, there'll be more consolidation, and the brands will shrink, and the, the 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 guests and the loyalty programs will be a lot more clearer to those that are a part of it. And I, that's not that hasn't happened. The brands the brands have grown, and uh, and certainly the soft brands have continued to progress and uh, and grow and pick up properties as well. So it's an interesting. It's interesting. I don't know what happens to the legacy brands. I, I don't. I don't know what's going to happen to those. Yeah. Uh, if these new brands are meant to swallow them up, if they become, I, I see a tremendous opportunity, honestly, in economy and lower mid scale mm-hmm. soft brands. Mm. It, you know what I mean? I well, think because we haven't we haven't focused on those yet, so it's kind of like new territory, right? Right. right. And so there's so much opportunity for. Uh, you, you know, a repositioning to take place in an exterior corridor with a pool in the middle of a of a U-shaped, you know, motor court um, that can create a, a funky, cool vibe that is at a great price point yep. um, that still offers something unique in a in a market that uh, you know has some has some cachet or has some interesting components to it. Oh, so for sure, that's I, something that may come down the pike. I think so too, and I want to dig down into that topic a little bit deeper. But before we do that, I want to say a couple of uh, controversial things about the overbranding that we're having in in the business. And feel free to jump in or feel free to uh, be agnostic. <laughs> in this part of the conversation because I understand where you're coming from. Uh, you had mentioned that a lot more hard brands are being introduced. I am I fully believe that a lot of these brands are being introduced uh, for two reasons. Um, number one, as the companies start to become larger and larger and consolidating, they need to have a fuller brand of uh, portfolio. You know, a lot more brands within their portfolio and creating new brands and leveraging the reservation system and their existing group of owners also pays off. But simultaneously, um, they also need to have product so that the other companies can't sell into those markets. So if I have XYZ Hotel from a major hotel company, um, if I open up another brand, then I could build that hotel right across the street without worrying about um, you know, any of the rules we have in place to make you know, uh, impact rules that are in place. Um, my franchise guys can make money. Wall Street can see uh, increased um, money. And uh, ev- ev- I think everybody's a winner except maybe um, the hoteliers within that hotel market. Um, a- am I right on in some parts about this? Or are you just want to make sure you don't get on the bad side of uh, some of these major hotel companies? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think uh, to, your, to your second point, uh, y- you know, I, think, I think that there's some, some obvious validity there, right, with, yeah. with acquiring as many brands as you possibly can, and therefore creating, uh, you know, barriers to entry. I think any with any business, I think that's a smart play, right? Uh-huh. I think yeah, for sure. The less the less barriers to entry, or the more barriers to entry you have, you know, the less opportunity there is for more supply, which is mm-hmm. in our industry and many industries is a is a killer. And so that's right. That's I guess that's just capitalism with people, uh, you know, trying to grow their business and then protect their business. So. Right. Um, but I, but I obviously see that as being something that that the brands would do. Why, why else would they consolidate? Why would why would uh, you know why would you grow more brands within a within a company if in fact the idea isn't to have more hotels right. that are underneath the umbrella in any given market? Yeah. Now I'm starting to get concerned with the overall um, consolidation issue. Something that I'll follow up in additional podcasts and on uh, on video and putting together a video on that um, n- now, which you may have already seen if you're watching this because I'm not sure when this interview is going to run, but. Uh, I will I will say that I think the hotel industry might be making a, a mistake when they're creating all these new brands and buying brands to put in their portfolio. I, I thought the word of 2017 was swim lanes.
brands. That was a big expression, right? All the brands want to have yeah, clear yeah. definitions for each one of their brands, which I think is great when um, you and I are having conversations at a hotel conference. But I don't think customers are paying attention to this, nor should they, nor should they care at all. At, at all. I mean, they look at it, I think, in a price point. I don't think any consumer is going to be able to tell you really demonstrably the difference between a Hampton and a True, for example. And uh, we will be having the uh, Alex, Alexander Jarrett, who runs True on the hotel on the show in the next couple of weeks, because they're saying, oh, I can save five or seven bucks here or there. I don't think that they see it as definitively different as we would like to in our business. Do you see any of that kind of fooling ourselves thing happening or am I yeah, just Yeah, I mean wrong? it just no <laughs> no I, I think I think a lot of it will lie also in the loyalty program. I think if we begin to confuse mm-hmm. we as a as an industry yes. uh begin to confuse our our loyal guests, our loyal customers, take take any brand that you want. If 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 I'm loyal to that brand and I don't even know if if a new brand is introduced, I have no idea if if that's within the group that I'm loyal to or not, I think that's that's I think that's a cause for concern, right? Because the loyalty programs are are one of the major strengths of being associated with any brand, whether you're a whether you're a traveler or whether you're a hotelier. And so if we if if that begins to turn into a commodity or begins to turn into something that isn't very clearly recognizable, then I think loyalty can be jeopardized with any given brand because if a guest doesn't understand you know, half the hotels that are in there that, that they have access to from a loyalty standpoint, then they're obviously not going to be loyal. So I just think that that's a that's a potential red flag. Uh, yeah. And here's uh, my uh, uh, snooty comment about that. I'm not even sure some of the executives know all the brands that are in their portfolios anymore. <laughs> there are so many <laughs> uh, of them out there. But uh, I, first, I do want to say thank you for, um, you know, sticking with me with all of my uh, jerky questions that I'm asking you uh, t- you today. Um but uh, let's talk about those motel uh, conversions that we're seeing out there. I love, love, love the idea of taking all of these, um, you know, old downtrodden hotels that you see in, uh, you know, cliched movies that are, you know, two floor exterior corridor hotels where you think, um, you know, it's where they always meet the uh, the hooker in the parking lot to talk to the cops. Right. For <laughs> those, <laughs> those, those kind of things. But they're taking those old hotels and now turning them into something really cool. And like you said, retro and spectacular. I saw it, for example, at the uh, the Postcard Inn in St. Pete Beach, and now um, uh, Red Line Hotels Corp just uh, is relaunched their signature brand, which is focusing on this. They just opened up their first property. I love this idea. Where do you come down on it? I, I, I'm with you. I love it. Uh, we're doing three or four right now oh, that were cool. that were just acquired we're working with you know uh you know two two very cool architects that understand the space that mm-hmm. see the same vision the owner understands where it's going to be on the other side um you know it's for example right and this is that's not a conversation about deflagging right but no. uh you know for for one of our hotels that's that's on the in Cape Cod <clears throat> you know it was a holiday inn for 20 years or so and they they pulled the flag off um, and put some smart smart money into a renovation, mm-hmm. took it independent. It's an exterior quarter hotel, has a pool in the middle, and now it's it's you know three years later, four years later, it is one of the coolest uh, you know scenes uh, on the Cape. And so right. they, I think it start right. It starts with the vision. It starts with understanding how the underwriting is going to work to get it to where it needs to be, and then having a great architect and a management group that are going to execute it and. It, we see it as a tremendous opportunity, and it's a it's a great way for first time developers to get into the business because a lot of these assets aren't expensive, and they can get financing for, you know, a three, four, five, six million dollar project. Uh, if they if it's their first or second deal, and if you kind of develop some sort of esprit de corps on how you do those, you can you can begin to clip those off pretty quick. And mm. uh, some of the coolest hotels in the country are. We're old motels, and it's such a it's such a cool new space that's that's coming about. I love how everything comes around again. I remember when I first started in this business, uh, you know, over twenty years ago now, uh, and I was writing for a, a trade magazine, and the whole thing was getting rid of exterior corridor hotels. Now we're going to put these new build ho- car, you know, hotels and corridors inside. But now it seems like people are embracing that that old yeah. school kind of vibe and appeal. But 
yes, I get customers like it, but at the same time, our tastes have changed. And you're able to uh, address that with a lot of the design elements in there. But what about when it comes to the bathroom? We're starting to get used to having bigger bathrooms, for example, in hotels. Or is it a scenario where people are more forgiving because they understand the building's 40, 50, 60 years old? Yeah, I think it's more the latter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. The bathrooms are getting bigger, but yeah, it's more the latter. I think it's, 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 it's hitting a certain, hitting a certain price point, hitting a certain traveler right. that really is, is probably not going to spend a ton of time in their room. Uh, they want to experience the, uh, you know, what, what is on, on property. Mm-hmm. If, if there's some sort of a scene going on at the pool or wh- wherever it's located. And, and a lot of times some of these motels are located in some of the best uh, positions within right. a city. or Because they were the first ones town. built, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. they've been there forever, and so they yeah. can walk everywhere, right? And, and so it's not, you know, it's not like it's a resort where you, you know, everything has to be bigger because they're spending more time in their, in their room. And, uh, it, it, you know, the bathrooms are just an example of something that, you know, people seem to be okay with because they understand where the bones are. And more right. people appreciate the historic piece of it and 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 it's more of a uh they they just identify with doing something that's just not your your run-of-the-mill uh design bathroom and i i love that whole you know classic 60s era pastiche for example i mean my you know no vacancy logo has that kind of feel to it so i get it i think it's fun i think it's interesting and I, i love that you said it's a great entree into the industry for first or second time developers that part of it is really exciting to me too for these uh for these young men and women to come in and be able to develop um hotels more easily and in a potentially less complex way than some of the projects you've matured onto Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, we've we've seen a lot of first time developers, whether whether we're managing or not, but just come into projects and, uh, you know, obviously the it it takes you know they 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 don't have the experience that that others do, and uh, so the time lag may be a little longer. But man, once they you know there's so much passion in it, and there's so much uh, desire to make it right that ultimately it's it's come out great on the back end. Yeah, uh, for, for a lot of these people. Uh, and now you know a lot of these hotels are independent hotels, or like I said, uh, you know, Signature has now started, or soft branded hotels. But I'm also seeing an exciting trend over the last four or five years is hitting the mainstream, and again, you were all uh, ahead of this beforehand. Of secondary and tertiary cities really starting to embrace non-branded hotel culture with fun, lifestyley boutique type of uh, hotels. Um, so why do you think it's finally happening and what took it so long to, for people to realize that, you know, smaller markets can, can ha- have these hotels? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a combination of quite a few things. I think uh, obviously when you, when you look at an independent hotel in a tertiary market, um, you know, you're, you're starting with the top line and how is that going to make, make it, make it a profitable, profitable, uh, asset. Right. And mm-hmm. so the brands, if, if, if a brand, uh, conceptually isn't necessary, then, then that's going to create a whole lot more profitability if you're able to achieve the same top line, right. because it's going to be a whole lot more expensive to operate as a brand. And so I think that on top of just the, the playing field has been leveled from a distribution standpoint by you know the sophistication of the internet and the sophistication mm-hmm. of uh channel management so you have the ability as you, you know the do drop in wherever you're located to be recognized you know in the same channels across the world that you know a marriott might be represented in and so obviously there is there's a sauce that goes into you know how you yield and how you promote and you know how you get more eyeballs on whatever it is you're selling um, but if you're able to do both of those things in a way that doesn't require somebody else to, 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 to do it for you with their pipes, i.e. a brand, then obviously from a profitability standpoint, the hotel is going to look a whole lot better in the underwriting than it would as a brand. Now, again, right, we get into the conversation of when is a brand needed, when is it not needed, right. and it just depends on the market. It depends on how many rooms are going to be in the hotel, what kind of segments do this, does this hotel need to appeal to, is there meeting space, blah, 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 blah. There's all those things that come into play because at some point there may be a requirement, not a requirement, but there may be a heavy need for a brand because those are just pieces that you cannot fill in the hotel without a brand, right? But it's understanding where that threshold exists when you're, when you're building these independent hotels. And you're right, there's a tons of secondary and tertiary markets where 
this 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 independent hotel is going to be the center of town is going to be the main you know the main bar the main restaurant mm-hmm. the main hotel uh it, and it's going to kind of drive a repositioning or driving a resurgence for that for that town or that city uh and we're involved in quite a few right now and it's so exciting because you got you have the whole city behind you and trying to make this thing successful and that's that's really cool that's I mean, awesome that that has everybody you know so yeah michael i kind of I, I kind of picture it being like what it must have been like in let's say 1910 1920 when the grand dame hotels really came into their own right and they became that fixture for the community and everybody wanted to be there and now it's so cool to see instead of that happening in new york it's happening in you know bethlehem pennsylvania or wherever it it might be how cool is that um so the last thing um that i want to talk to you about is what are you most excited about in terms of opportunity for uh, hospitality and your company in the coming year? Um, well, it just seems like uh, the the pipeline continues to flush, right? So I think that, um, you know, everybody is always concerned when we, when we turn the year and we go into the next year, what is, what does it look like? What, right. What's the stability with the capital markets and everything else? And, you know, having just come back from Alice and, mm-hmm. you know, having read what Smith travels put out and everybody else about the projections for 18, um, you know, cross our fingers, everything seems to be progressing uh, with a continued growth rate. And that is, that's awesome. That is very cool because I think, you know, a lot of our projects um, are, you know, adaptive reuse, are new builds, uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot of development in the pipeline. And so we hope that that continues because we love to come in early on projects. We love to be able to influence the design and influence the programming. And so, the more those projects continue to be financed and, and, and there's capital available to do the projects, I think that puts us in a great position to really help developers and really help you know equity groups get some stuff done. So yep. that's kept me ex- excited as we turn the corner into 18. Now, now I know I said that was going to be my last thing, but that you got me thinking. I love adaptive reuse projects. I think they are so cool because you're able to take what is quintessentially the neighborhood that you're in and create something new and exciting that harkens back to that time. Is there a particular project that you're working on now that's adaptive reuse that you're particularly giddy about yeah there, there's a couple i think the one that's closest to opening is the one in Asheville, north carolina mm-hmm. uh, which is actually a soft brand it's it's a curio it's called the foundry mm-hmm. um and it is it's special i mean obviously Asheville is a you know is is a super cool vibe town uh it's got great music it's got great food it's up in the mountains it's just the scene there is great and so the hotel was created uh, within a series of uh, buildings that used to provide um, the what what the van, what the uh, Biltmore was built from, right? That's the foundry. So so uh-huh. the steel that was used to create the uh, Biltmore was was on this on the spot, and so Jeez. that's that's how we've kind of played this into the adaptive reuse. Um, and everything there is is a bit industrial, and it's very it's very Asheville for being something that's uh, new, but it still brings the old into the design, into our menus and everything else. So it's it's gotten us really jazzed, and we can't wait to get that thing open in in such a cool market like Asheville. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. That's coming this uh, spring in three historic buildings. Uh, combined with some new construction, 92-room boutique hotel. Looking forward to seeing that. I can't wait. All right. Um, anything else that you want to say before we wrap up? I don't think so, Glenn. I, I appreciate the time today and the opportunity to chat with you. Well, my pleasure. But before we go, I have to give you this opportunity. It's time for a shameless plug. How can we find Charlestown Hotels and give us your best value proposition to get folks to want to work with you? <laughs> <laughs> com is where you can find us and read all about uh, some of our projects and uh, about some of the executives that and the uh, marketing and management and revenue team that make things happen. That's where you can find out all about what it is that we do and how we do it. Great. I, I love it. And uh, my shameless plug, guys, make sure that you give me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. I love that. It feeds my ego. I need it. I, I feel terrible about myself. And your five-star ratings give me the hope to live. That's right. My life depends on you. 
giving me a five star rating on uh, Facebook, Michael. I'm really turning it up on that one, aren't I? Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to thank everybody for listening today. I, I, I'm so excited to have had Michael here today. What a great guest. What an interesting conversation. And uh, thanks again, Michael, for putting up with my uh, being so um, snarky today about the, the state of the hospitality industry. And thank you all for listening. And we will be back next week. That is, unless I decide to move into a Conestoga wagon at the Capitol Reef Resort. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.